Welcome back to our Bible study as we are making our way through the book of John. This week, we are finishing up chapter 14. I'd like to thank Jared who filled in for me for the last two weeks while I was out. I don't have any announcements this week other than to encourage you guys to continue to invite guys out to this study in our study of Revelation next year. And for those of you who are watching online and are not members of BSF, I would encourage you to join a BSF group or a BSF online group so you can study the Bible and community through the BSF fourfold approach. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we approach your word today, open the eyes of our souls and minds so that we may receive your truth and apply it to our lives. Take away our distractions that would prevent us from hearing from you. We give you this time to convict us where we need conviction and encourage us where we need encouraging. In Christ's powerful name, amen. As we get going today, I'm sure many of you guys are aware of the benefits of mentoring and being mentored. I would think most of us could stand up and talk about how we were mentored either growing up, in school, in the workplace, or maybe in the military. Our testimonies would include how a person who believed in us took us under their wing and spent time pouring into our lives so that we could reach places and go places that we could not have done without this invaluable personal mentorship. Now, Christian mentorship is similar to the secular world, but it does have one big distinction. Christian mentoring focuses not on self-improvement or personal development. It's about helping people become like another person. And that person is Jesus. In today's passage, John introduces us to our common mentor, who is actively working on us from the inside and in developing our character to be like Jesus. So today, our lesson is divided into two divisions. Our first division is John chapter 14, verses 15 through 24, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And our second division is John chapter 14, verses 25 through 31, the ministry of of the Holy Spirit. As we get started in our first division, the gift of the Holy Spirit, please turn to John chapter 14, verse 15. Let me ask you a question. What is harder, to pick up a sword and go out in a blaze of glory proclaiming your love for Jesus, or to daily wake up and consistently express your love for Jesus every day through consistent obedience to his commands. I would say daily obedience. Now, people like to talk about God's love and our love for God, but often people don't make the link between our love for God and our obedience. Something about obedience and submission that grinds away at our fallen nature. Jesus is aware of the human heart condition and how we are incapable of obedience on our own. So <clears throat> as we get ready to dive into verse 15, let's back up one verse, the verse 14, which acts as a link, the verse 15. Last week we covered verse 14, but let's read it again in light of our lesson this week. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. In Old Testament time, the gift of the Holy Spirit was rare and often temporary. King Saul had the Holy Spirit taken away when he was disobedient to God's commands. King David prayed not to have the Holy Spirit taken away from him when he sinned with Bathsheba. So when Jesus said, you may ask me for anything, we aren't told what the disciples were thinking but from verse 15, it seems that Jesus knew the disciples needed the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. 
even if they didn't formally ask for it through prayer. Now, let's read verse 15. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. In verse 15, Jesus establishes an unbreakable link between love for God and obedience to Jesus' commands. Now, someone might say, oh, no worries. I got it. Obedience, not a problem. But I would say, go to Matthew chapter 5 and reread the Sermon on the Mount. Obediently following Jesus' commands are not humanly possible, at least not in our own strength. We need God's strength through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to be obedient, and Jesus knew it. We are entering a section of the Gospel of John that is rich in verses of the Holy Spirit. You can't read through the Gospel of John without encountering many verses about the truth of the Trinity and the truth of the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> unbelievers seem to have some knowledge of Jesus and God the Father at, on some level, but generally, they are badly informed of who the Holy Spirit is. And verses 17 answers the question of why this is the case. So let's read it. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him <clears throat> because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. John uses the word the world to convey fallen humanity that is hostile to God's plan because of the rejection of Jesus. And these people don't see nor know the Holy Spirit. The people who don't see are spiritually blind to the work of the Holy Spirit. Like the Pharisees who, <clears throat> like the Pharisees who physically see but were spiritually blind, because they rejected Jesus, the Apostle Paul refers to these people as natural man. Let's read what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man does not, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But Jesus, <clears throat> in the second half of verse 17, explains the intimate relationship between believers in Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Through faith in Jesus, we know the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives with us and lives inside of us, also called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Paul also further explains this amazing truth in 1 Corinthians 6.19. Let's read it. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you receive from God? What an amazing gift and privilege to have the Holy Spirit, who is God, living and dwelling inside of each one of us. As you probably could have guessed, the BSF doctrine focus this week is the Holy Spirit. There are many misconceptions about the identity of the Holy Spirit. If you find your theology from the Star Wars movie series, you might view the Holy Spirit as a mystical force of the universe. If you're Muslim, you would say the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel. But long before Islam was around, there were the Gnostics' distorted view of Christianity. And the Gnostics saw the Holy Spirit as a divine feminine. About seven years ago, a popular Christian book and movie came out featuring a female Holy Spirit, which is an example of how Gnostic beliefs continue to subtly influence church teaching. But since this is a Bible study, what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? Simply put, the Bible declares that the Holy Spirit is God. He is the third person of the Trinity. He works in perfect coordination and alignment with the Father and Son. 
All three are fully God and together accomplish God's purposes. The Holy Spirit played an active role in creation. From that point on, he was acti- he he has actively worked to fulfill God's redemptive plan. After Jesus departed physically from earth, God's very presence, the Holy Spirit, came to dwell within and empower all who put their faith in Jesus. The Holy Spirit actively draws people to salvation in Christ and enables believers to live for God. The Holy Spirit permanently indwells every believer, revealing and applying God's truth in ways that transforms them to love, obey, and glorify God. The Holy Spirit also fills believers, equipping and empowering them for specific works for God and to witness for Him. But what happens when someone rejects the truth of the Holy Spirit as revealed in the Bible? When someone doesn't believe that God actively works through the Holy Spirit today, they fail to recognize God's work and worth. They cannot understand God's word and walk in his ways without the help of his spirit. Without the Holy Spirit's work, they will not recognize their own sin and their need for a savior. Now, before we get back to the chapter, I'm sure many of us grew up reading the King James Bible. And in the King James, the Holy Spirit is often referred to as the Holy Ghost. Now, why is that? Have you under have you ever wondered why? Because the word ghost has changed so much in the last 500 years, it can throw you a little bit when someone says Holy Ghost. So why are the two different names used? Is it speaking of two different aspects of the one spirit? Well, there's no theological reason why the Holy Spirit is sometimes referred to as the Holy Ghost. The reason for the difference is found in the story behind the translation of the King James Bible. When the New Testament was translated from Greek into English, it was done by different committees. One of the committees constantly translated the Greek word pneuma as spirit, while the other committee translated it as ghost. When the translation was completed, these differences remained. But in the newer, modern-day translations, the Greek word pneuma is consistently translated as spirit. Let's turn back to our passage and read verse 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. When Jesus can no longer be seen physically by the world, believers will continue to see him. The presence of the Holy Spirit is the means by which this promise is fulfilled, while obedience is the method. As we grow in obedience, our relationship with Jesus strengthens as a result. And we see him not physically, but spiritually. Now, often Jesus is teaching with questions from the disciples. And verse 22 is one of those times. So let's read it before we discuss it. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? The gist of Judas's question was, Why is Jesus being selective in disclosing himself? Before we move on to Jesus' response, let's take a moment and cover what we know about Judas, not Iscariot. Now, let's first discuss his name. He is known as Thaddeus, Lebius, Jude the Apostle, Judas the son of James, and Judas, not Iscariot. Scholars tend to say Thaddeus was probably his nickname, But for today, that is how I will refer to him. Thaddeus was a mystery disciple. There isn't much written about him. This section of John 
are his only spoken words in the Bible. Church history and tradition says after Pentecost, he traveled north to modern-day Turkey to start a church. According to tradition, he was either clubbed or axed to death for his faith in Jesus. But what we can be sure of, Thaddeus, like the other disciples, left his former life to follow and serve Jesus Christ, faithfully enduring hardship and persecution. Even though we don't have much to go on, let's see what we can learn from his question. First, he felt comfortable enough in his relationship with Jesus to interrupt him and ask him a question. Second, Thaddeus wanted to know why Jesus would treat the disciples differently from the world. And lastly, like most first century Jews, Thaddeus was expecting a Messiah who would reveal himself in power to the world. Now let's start reading in verse 23 to see Jesus' response to Thaddeus. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. This seems to be a theme in our study today. Our love for God is expressed through obedience to his teaching. Love and obedience are inseparable for Christians. Actually, obedience is the fruit of love. Those who love and obey God are his children. Believers receive the Holy Spirit who reveals Christ to them, but Christ remains hidden to the unbelieving world. Essentially, God reveals himself to those who love and obey him. Which leads us to our first principle, which is spirit-filled filled believers know and love God. Spirit filled believers know and love God. The secular world often lives by the phrase, seeing is believing. This cliche influences their thinking when it comes to theological matters. If they can't stick it in a test tube or measure it in some way, they reject the unseeable, regardless of the evidence. The religion of science really boils down to man wanting to maintain sovereign control over the natural world while rejecting the supernatural providential hand of God in the world. But Jesus makes it clear that the Holy Spirit will take up residence inside believers, which will allow spirit-filled believers to know and love God. So the unbeliever says, seeing is believing. We say, walk by faith and not by sight. And when we walk by faith, we love God. And our love is expressed through our faithful obedience to God. So let me ask you, how is the Holy Spirit giving you vision to see where God is wanting to work in your life? How is the Holy Spirit giving you vision to see where God is wanting to work in your life? <clears throat> As we start our second division, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, please turn to verse 25. Before we read scripture, understanding the ministry of the Holy Spirit is vital to all believers throughout the church age. And so in this last division, we covered who is the Holy Spirit. And in this division, we're covering the purpose of the Holy Spirit. With that, let's read verse 26. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. In the last division, Jesus told the disciples that he was leaving, and this news sent them into an emotional tailspin. Their Messiah, their teacher, their miracle worker, who they had left their families and ways of life for, was leaving them. It's probably hard for us to tap into how sorrowful and desperate the disciples must have been feeling. They were, they were having to face the reality of confronting life without Jesus. They would have to depend upon the Holy Spirit 
to give them perfect recall and help them pass on the Lord's teaching without error. The ministry of the Holy Spirit would help the disciples to understand the meaning of Jesus' sayings, teachings, and actions. Now, when faced with such difficult news and overwhelming responsibility, it might have created fear and anxiety in the disciples. But if the disciples were to be effective in spreading the gospel around the world, they would need to be at peace on the inside while they operated in a chaotic world that generally was opposed to Jesus. And so let's read verse 27 and see what their source of internal peace would be. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus gave the disciples the peace they would need to navigate through the time between the cross and the, re and the resurrection, and in the future when they would establish the early church. But Jesus also gave a legacy of peace to all who would trust in him and choose to follow him. This divinely given peace allows believers to remain calm and continue to be effective in serving God in a turbulent, chaotic world that often seems out of control. Imagine watching a championship football or basketball game with a group of friends. Your friends are watching for the first time, but you had already watched the pre-recording the pre and knew the outcome of the game. Consequently, you would watch the game much differently than your friends who had not seen it before where you would watch with a sense of peace and confidence, they would gasp and cringe every time their team made a mistake or the other team pulled ahead. But you would be watching through the lens of assured outcome. So you would remain relatively unaffected. Jesus told his disciples ahead of time, so they would have peace during the time of the trials and the cross. And next year, when we study the book of Revelation, we learn how God wraps up human history and will fully understand the extent of the great victory Jesus won at the cross. So <clears throat> we can also view our circumstances through the lens of assured outcome and have peace as we go through this life serving God. Even when it feels like the world is becoming more evil, as Jesus said in the tail end of the verse, we don't have to allow our hearts to be troubled. We don't have to be afraid because we fight from victory and we know the ending. Moving on to verse 28, Jesus continues to make this point and reiterates God the Father's plan. You heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. At this point, Jesus had predicted his death and resurrection to the disciples many times. Mary had already anointed him with her spike nard for his burial, but the disciples failed to grasp the victory that would result through Jesus' death and resurrection. If they could view his death as being part of the Father's plan, which was unstoppable, then instead of being fearful, they could be hopeful. At times, we can fall into negative perspective on life as Christians. We desire tranquility and a smooth ride, like we are on a luxury cruise ship. But in reality, we're on a battleship engaging a defeated but powerful enemy. As we wrap up this chapter, let's read verse 30 and see who our enemy is. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. There had been a spiritual battle brewing of cosmic proportions since Genesis chapter 3. 
God said the following to the serpent in verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Like a master chess player, our Lord used Satan's evil desires to kill the son of God to lure him into fulfilling God's plan to die on the cross for the past, present, and future sins of the world. But why is Satan referred to as the prince of the world? When Adam chose to disobey God, all of creation fell under the dominion of the serpent, the author of sin, evil, death, and corruption. The incarnation of God in the person of Jesus was an invading force, a liberating force of one who came to free us from the dominion of sin and the sting of death through his death on the cross. As believers in the 21st century, living in the postmodern world, do we still encounter this defeated enemy? Well, I like how the Apostle Paul brings clarity to this question in Ephesians 6. Let's read it. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our enemy has been defeated, but he's still powerful, and he has a large demonic army. And as we engage the enemy, 1 John 4.4 4 gives us additional confidence. Let's read it. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, we can be victorious in our daily struggles and spiritual battles. Which brings us to our second principle, which is spirit-filled believers are empowered by the Holy Spirit and have peace. Spirit-filled believers are empowered by the Holy Spirit and have peace. Jesus' words and commands can cause us anxiety when we don't rest in the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Even though we are redeemed, we still have a fallen nature, and we live in a fallen world. But Jesus has said, if we love him, we will obey his commands. Part of his commands are to die to self and pick up our cross daily. We are to love the unlovable. We are to forgive those who despise us and have done evil to us. And we are to bring the message of the gospel to people who don't want to hear it. The these are just a few of the commands we are to be obedient to. How can we do these things? Well, in our own power, we can't. But through the supernatural empowering of the Holy Spirit, we can do all things through God. This empowering help and mentorship from the Holy Spirit gives believers internal peace, a peace which the world doesn't know or understand. In fact, believers can have peace even when the world is falling apart around them. So let me ask you, how is the Holy Spirit leading you to peace in a difficult situation? How is the Holy Spirit leading you to peace in a difficult situation? As we wrap up today, the big idea for this chapter is the work of the Holy Spirit there are many aspects of the Christian life that unifies all believers in Jesus, but one of them is we all share the same mentor, and that is the Holy Spirit, who actively empowers us to have the capacity to love and to be obedient to Jesus' commands. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we desire to be men who live obediently to Jesus' commands. Not because we must, but because we love Jesus. We pray that you will continue to empower us, the Holy Spirit, so that the Holy Spirit can continue the work of sanctification inside of us. 
and give us the peace that surpasses all understanding as we journey through this world that is growing more hostile towards Jesus and his followers. In Christ's name, amen. Oh,